my my space that I have, the paperboyprints.com love gallery in Brooklyn, in North Brooklyn, Bushwick, um, we've given out over $2.5 million in food to the community. Thousands mm. of families fed, and this has been a consistent thing going on uh, week by week, day by day. I just created our, our first housing project as a, um, uh, as a model for housing for all called Tiny House NYC, where I built my first home in Brooklyn, uh, a tiny house where anyone can rent it out uh, and for the night for free. So, you know, finding solutions to these problems on a small scale with what we have right now and then building as we grow, right? I went from just delivering a couple bags of food in my car to having tractor trailers, 18 wheelers pull up to our space week after week with uh, completely full of food to give away to the community. So for us, it's our track record of consistent service in a real way, you know, and and the lack thereof of our elected officials. And on top of that, I've thrown some of the largest protests in New York City history, right? Uh, myself, mm. uh, as an activist, right? That's the thing that kind of gets buried here and that a lot of the journalists, podcasters uh, don't note. They even CNN and all these folks, they talk about, oh, look at the new activists that are running for office now. And they don't talk about myself who, while running for Congress, we shut down the Williamsburg Bridge. Mm. We shut down the Brooklyn Bridge. Mm. We shut down Myrtle Broadway. We, like so many protests that I organized myself. Now, it wasn't without the help of thousands of community members that came and we rallied together. But, you know, I have to be honest about it that, you know, when I showed up, it was, it was just me. Right. And and being able to rally that support in the streets at a time when it mattered most. Was this last at a time summer? where I could, this was last summer mm. that, you know, I've done protests before that uh, very large protests before that online and in person. But last summer, I bring this up. I'm, I'm talking about what have you done for me lately, right? Yeah. Uh, just last summer, while other politicians were scrambling to talk about, oh, yeah, police brutality. Blah, blah. Wait, you've been in office for 20 years. I haven't he heard you do anything about police brutality. I haven't heard you put your body on the line, your career on the line at all for, for black lives. And then now that it's trending, you want to show up and put on a kente cloth. Uh-uh. <laughs> for me, I've been representing our culture, our style, um in so many ways with how I live my life with our activism and our political work again I'm the only person in this race what made me run to really get to the to your question mm -hmm. Brianna was that the issues that are facing us weren't being talked about and the mm -hmm. people that are talking about them don't have that uh lived experience you know I'm the mm -hmm. I'm I'm the youngest blackest person in the mayor race right the, the, so so and I'm not saying that to be like oh that's why you should vote for me saying that to when we talk about police brutality my experience should be at the top of the list because i've had more police interactions in the last year than many of the other candidates have had in in their lives so they don't even know what's what's the issues there are. People and this is one of the biggest about issues because like one interesting thing that's emerged is that eric adams has used the fact that he was stopped and frisked as a black man in his youth or a black kid um, as a way to kind of cover up the fact that he's one of the more tough on crime candidates in the race, you know, a, a, a former cop. So, you know, does that complicate at all, you know, how you think people should perceive arguments about lived experience um, or, you know, identity as a stand in for what someone believes in? Identity and lived experience are two different things. So, you know, I think, again, with the Eric Adams thing, you know, he's been in office for a long time. These things haven't changed. He's been in power in the police department for a long time. Mm -hmm. These things haven't changed. I, I, I don't see, like, if they have changed, I would love to see the facts and figures on that. Mm -hmm. I don't see how having him there now is going to help. You know, I made a song about it, mm -hmm. about his policy. I don't know. Have you heard it? I haven't. Oh, you really got to look it up. It's called Eric Adams. It's one of the biggest uh, campaign media pieces in this whole race right okay, and ooh. a lot of campaigns have used it against eric adams and it's called eric adams get out of my room what you doing in my room eric adams get out of my room what you doing in my room like tens of thousands of views on twitter all over social media stuff like that i used rap to talk about the issues with eric adams mm. right because sometimes when we talk about it as plainly as we are it doesn't connect with people it doesn't have the reach it's not as catchy but those, those songs have really uh, stuck through. And again, 
when it co comes about lived experience, you have to start dissecting the background of these folks. Mm. I'm the only non-millionaire in the race. Mm. Only one not backed by billionaires. They can say all this and that, but all of these other folks are millionaires, multimillionaires. Do I have a problem with millionaires? No. Would I love to be that well off and have those amount of resources to be able to help folks with one day? Ha, <laughs> paper, yeah, mm. of course I would. But do I think that those folks are the ones to bring us back from a pandemic right now? No way. Mm. There is no way. They're the same ones that got us in this mess. Mm. Wait, you mean the lady that was on de Blasio's administration from the get-go? The one that's going to help us pick up the pieces? Are you serious right now? Wait, you mean the same police officer that's touting the same policies that have been terrorizing black Americans since longer than I've been alive is the one that brings us back? Are you kidding me right now? Wait, you mean the same people that have been backed by the tech industry that has disenfranchised us, stolen so much of our data, our information, our creativity, are the one that they're the one to bring us back? Are you kidding me? Yeah. No way. We need new voices. We need new people chosen by the people. Again, like I, like, like I said, I've gotten more votes than everybody in this race. Yeah. Everybody. A year ago, the only two people in the whole entire mayor, mayoral race that have gotten more votes than me are in office right now. And that's Eric Adams and Scott Stringer. Everyone else has gotten less votes than me. Andrew Yang, when he ran for president last year, he got less votes in the entire city than I did just in my district, in District 7, of, uh, uh, which includes North Brooklyn, some of Queens, and, uh, excuse me, Brooklyn, Queens, and uh, some of Lower East Side of Manhattan, right? I got more votes in that than him. So my point being is that they keep saying that, oh, but you have this and that, and the people aren't ready, and da, da, da. I'm like, are you kidding me? Do, do you follow politics? Or do you just look at CNN and go to sleep? <laughs> no, I'm being serious. Yeah. We got to stop saying politics is just what the white folks on CNN and MSNBC say. It's yeah. not that. Because the, the, the people in the streets are awake right now. The, the, the new voices, the young people are awake and they're not going back to sleep. I'm not going to let them. We're too energized. Our, our, our message cuts through the noise. It cuts through the noise. They're going to have to find a way to stop it. They're going to have to. Because we're doing it with no money. That's scary. Everyone polling above me right now is spending like three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a week to keep their campaign alive. A week! Sure. Paper, it's really refreshing to hear you speak with a certain level of urgency because part of what's been really frustrating for me is to watch how people are very quick to want to go back to pretending like the pandemic didn't happen and like the pandemic didn't expose all the vulnerabilities with our system and make them very plain for everyone to see. And there's a way that when you turn on the mainstream news, to your point, the coverage doesn't reflect the crisis that working class people are still living in. And frankly, lived in even prior to COVID, as someone who's closer to what's going on in New York among regular people. Can you talk to us a little bit about the stories that you hear and, and what you, you, you hear about going on as you're doing some of your um, community work? Right, so one of the main things for me that is a, uh, that's important is our schools, hmm. right? And education and our parents. I was just saying today that parents are like the cheat code to fixing society. Right. If, if we save parents, save America, save families, we save America. And I don't mean that in the like uh, Breitbart News way. I mean, actually, mm -hmm. like innovative solutions to to save families. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and we propose a lot of those. And part of these ideas I throw out. So I'm hoping some of these other politicians steal them, run with them and pretend like their own. But just follow through. Um, when I talk to folks and I, I mentioned schools because I've had the opportunity to meet with a lot of students. High schoolers, parents, they're some of the biggest supporters of our campaign. They've helped mm. to get they've helped to turn a lot of parents into paperboy fans. And you know, one of the things that they've told me is, hey, because mm. of the virus, I didn't get a chance to uh, spend time with my teachers uh, after class, build those relationships so I can get recommendations, so I can ask those questions, so I can have that mentorship. Mm. I didn't have that. I didn't have time to spend time with my coaches, get that uh, extra year of extracurricular activities to make my um, uh, to make my resume more competitive not just in my city not just in the state but globally right now our students are having to compete globally they they have a, a they have global competition in the economic space 
and in the job space where our parents didn't have that and, f and our current politicians don't know what's going on. I talked about this in my run for Congress. I'm like, you're talking about jobs and creating more jobs. When's the last time you've had to apply for a job mm. and go on one of these websites where you have to know how to use keywords, change your resume up every time just so you get noticed and then are in that thousand emails that get, get noticed, right? It's so many things going on and there is no real way to fix them without talking about love. And our message of love is really resonating with a lot of folks, folks that I didn't think. You know, we, we go around in our tank. I'm reporting to you live from our love tank. We have an event uh, that's happening right now, but I, I pause to talk to you. I really you know, appreciate it. No, definitely. They, um, I was had a long day campaigning. I'm sitting here and I was on, the, on a phone call. I have our doors open like I often do. Mm. And uh, open door policy. <laughs> Paper, <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm sitting here just like I'm talking to the same spot. And a guy comes in the love tank and he's like, is Paperboy Prince in here? Is Paperboy in here? And I, I get startled. I'm like, whoa. The guy looks like um, Alec Baldwin, right? <laughs> uh, and he's like, he's like, yo, my, and uh, our videographer was there at this time, uh, Marlo. And the guy comes in and he's like, is Paperboy here, Paperboy? And I'm like, hi. He's like, yo, Paperboy, man, I love you. I love what you're doing. He, he has a, a woman friend with him and she's like less sold. She doesn't really know who I am. And the, the, uh, the guy is like, I'm a conservative, man. I'm a conservative. I'm registered as a Democrat because you're New York. You know, I, I, that's the only way I can vote. But, like, I love what you're doing. And mm -hmm. our, our videographer is like, yo, P Paper's on a phone call right now. Do you mind if I interview you? And he's talking to him. And he's, like, trying to get him to say something Trump supportery, I guess. I don't know why. <laughs> but he's like, and the guy is like, he, so he's asking about the policy. But what about Paper's policies? He's asked kind of the most far left policies New York has ever seen. And the guy's like, Man, it's not about the policies. It's about the love. It's going to bring so many more people into this process. It's going to actually bring people together. Look at him. Look at me. I'm support We have this on video, by the way. He's like, look at him. Look at me. Like, I'm supporting him because of this love. I'm supporting them because, you know. And yeah. like, for me, that, that to me makes me go so much harder for the love because it's making me realize that we have more in common than we think. We have so much more in common. We want... To, to have safe communities. We want to be able to, to, to live our dreams out. We want to have a great life, right? But when yeah. we focus on our differences, we'll never get that, that done and achieved. So, so for me, you know, spreading love and really inspiring folks, inspiring folks. And then, like I said, our, our, our platform is, is not a joke. It's really real. It's a reason that an establishment does not want us to win. It's because once this platform gets out there, they'll never be able to work in this town again. Hey YouTube, don't forget this is a podcast. To get full episodes, including ones that are behind a paywall, go to patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. To get more episodes, please do subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell, and like this video.